It's 10 o'clock. This is Sky News at 10, our top story. Inside the hospital being held up because of crumbling concrete. We look at the reality of the rack crisis in the NHS. Yeah, well, sleepless nights. I mean, it was, uh, you know, it was very worrying. And we, um, you know, to, to, to unearth the, the level of cracking that we found. The Home Secretary goes to the United States to make her case for a global fight against illegal migration, saying discrimination is not enough to claim asylum. I claim asylum because uh, I feel myself very free in the UK. We speak to the people who say they are seeking asylum in the UK after fleeing persecution. Five people accused of being part of a Russian spy ring are charged in London. And Sir Ian McKellen talks about the positive reception he's got from audiences as he returns to the stage. I didn't really think of it as being a gay play, but that, <laughs> of course it is. Uh, but that doesn't seem to face theatre audiences one little bit. Plus, we'll take a first look at tomorrow's front pages. That's coming up in our press preview from 10.30. Hello, good evening. First, there were school closures, and now Sky News has seen inside a hospital where ceilings are being held up with props because of crumbling rack concrete. The estate manager for the health board, which looks after Withybush Hospital in Pembrokeshire, said they were forced to quickly close off wards after cracks were found in the buildings. Well, dozens of NHS buildings have been affected by the concrete issues across England, Wales and Scotland. 16 of those are in Scotland, despite fewer than half of buildings being inspected so far. 27 hospitals have been affected in England, with just three completing their remedial works. And four hospitals in Wales are confirmed to have the dangerous concrete. Sky's Dan Whitehead has been inside the worst affected of the four with the Bush Hospital in Pembrokeshire from where he sent this report. There are no nurses, no doctors, just empty beds. Half the wards here are shut. It's become a ghost hospital, riddled with dangerous rack concrete. Downstairs, wards are still open, but there are hundreds of props, literally keeping the ceiling up. This is a prime example of what, of, of, uh, what we've had to uh, deal with. Uh, we've actually had to put 14 aqua props in this room, which completely negates it as a usable space for a clinical function. This is the, uh, the rack product. This is the uh, plank or a section of it. You can see it's, uh, it's very lightweight construction and you'll see it's, it's very, very crumbly. The seriousness of the problem here was uncovered back in May. Yeah, well, sleepless nights. I mean, it was, uh, you know, it was very worrying to unearth the, the level of cracking that we found. Um, I think uh, we, we mobilised um, very, very quickly in, uh, in having these areas uh, closed off. Other space in the hospital without rack was found. Some patients transferred elsewhere. But the discovery of so much aerated concrete left six of the 12 wards out of bounds. Eight weeks ago, this ward and five others in the hospital were full. There were up to 200 patients in beds. There were nurses and doctors manning the desks. In some cases, they had to evacuate in just 24 hours. Oh, Peter, have you seen that man down there? Sarah was working on the cardiac ward. Ensuring this hospital can still help the sickest of patients is a huge team effort. They're slowly fixing the issues and we're, everyone's slowly moving around back around the hospital. So um, in terms of how we're going to cope, not quite sure. Um, but we will because that's what we do, we adapt and, and we just get on with it. We have to because we're not important, it's the patients that are important. The Welsh Government has given the Withybush nearly £13 million to fix the problem. That money will enable us to undertake repair work to the planks that have been identified as high risk. Um, what that doesn't do, though, is provide a fix for the lifetime of the building. This hospital is uh, 50 years old. Um, it's, it, it's obviously clear that in terms of some of our ageing estate and environment, um, we're going to need another solution in the future to be able to 
to, to, to have facilities in West Wales that are fit for the for purpose in terms of delivering modern day healthcare. The repair work is already underway, but it will be April next year before all these wards reopen. The fact is, winter is coming and half the hospital is shut. Dan White is Sky News in Haverford West, Pembrokeshire. Now is our correspondent, Saba Chowdhury, who's outside Frimley Park Hospital in Camberley in Surrey, which is also facing rack issues, Saba. Good evening, Anna. Yes, that's right. The problem extends beyond Haverford West in Wales. In England, there are 27 hospitals confirmed to have uh, rack in them. Frimley Park Hospital here in Surrey is one of them. In fact, one in seven, uh, it's one of one in seven hospitals that is made nearly exclusively of rack. That's about 65 percent uh, of the building. This affects the wards, uh, the ICU unit, the theatre and many major departments. Now, the government have said that they are committed to ensuring that RAC is eradicated by uh, all NHS hospitals by 2035. But whether that actually happens, how realistic that is, really is another question. We know that investigations into RAC in hospitals are still ongoing. Uh, just look at Scotland, uh, for example, where that is very much still the case. So uh, things are already difficult for the NHS, Anna, and it looks like unsafe buildings is uh, another uh, issue uh, on that very high list. Sava, they're in Camberley. Thank you. The Home Secretary has today called for changes to the UN Refugee Convention from 1951, saying being gay is not a sufficient case for claiming asylum in the UK. Swella Bravman, who is the daughter of immigrants, was speaking in the United States and said the issue of illegal immigration was existential. The UN has responded tonight, saying that the Refugee Convention remains relevant today. In a moment, we'll get the response of some people claiming asylum in the UK at the moment. But first, our US correspondent Mark Stone reports from Washington. Home Secretary, why are you making a speech here and not in the UK? The Home Secretary has travelled a long way to reflect on an immigration mess that she is in charge of. But then she believes Britain is bound by a failing global asylum system. A neat deflection or provoking debate, probably both, and with language that's unprecedented for a Home Secretary. We will not be able to sustain an asylum system if, in effect, simply being gay or a woman or fearful of discrimination in your country of origin is sufficient to qualify for protection. Her audience, in the room at least, was just a few dozen, including her own staff. Seeking refuge in the first safe country you reach or shopping around for your preferred destination are not the same thing. I just wanted to pick up on the anecdote you just gave, uh, a very eloquent anecdote about your father, um, that he had no friends, no money, no passport, he wanted a better life. Do you accept that that is the story replicated throughout this migration journey? Every single one of those people has the same story that your father had, and I wonder how you could square that with your views that you have outlined this morning. What you're suggesting is because I'm the child of immigrants, I have to adopt a position which is pro-migration and pro uh, the status quo. And I totally and fundamentally refute that. I think that is uh, totally at odds with the challenge that we are facing today. Unprecedented levels of people coming to our country illegally with no right to be there, gaming our system. She didn't deny that this was about her too, her vision for a different Britain with different rules. Of course, none of this amounts to a policy announcement. It is rhetorical and it is designed to provoke. She wants to start an argument, a global debate about a global challenge. Her language, though, will certainly fire up her base on the right of a party she'd like to lead. New York is maybe the unlikely focus of the American end of this unprecedented movement. The once grand, now shuttered Roosevelt Hotel is the city's reception center, overwhelmed. In just a year, 100,000 people have arrived in Manhattan, most bussed from the southern border by politicians who want them to be someone else's problem, testing a city's liberal resolve. We're finding a way to get a future a good economy to try to help us and our families back in Venezuela to be able to live. 
I hope that there is a future, not so much for us, but for them. That's what I really want. They are the stories of Suella Braverman's father. He came at a time when the system could cope, encouraged migration. Now, it's a system of asylum that fails both political extremes and those at its heart. It is neither fair nor firm. Mark Stone, Sky News in the United States. Well, Sky's data and forensics team has been taking a look at the issue with illegal immigration and some of the numbers that the Home Secretary gave in her speech today. Swella Bravman said the current UN accord means 780 million could claim asylum right now, and that number is drawn from research which calculated who could technically be eligible around the world. Well, the number of people who claimed asylum through the UNHCR's refugee programme last year is far lower, about 29 million. The number of asylum claims in the UK has been trending upwards, hitting a high last year of more than 99,900. More than 18,000 applications were processed. Just over three quarters of those were granted refugee status or humanitarian protection. Today, Swilla Bravman said fearing discrimination for being gay or being a woman should not be a reason to claim asylum. There's no data on how many claims are being made on the basis of gender, but women represent only a quarter of asylum claims in the UK. And the number of applications being made on the basis of sexual orientation was around 1,300 last year, less than 2%, with most being made from countries which are not conflict zones. Sky's communities correspondent Becky Johnson has more. I claim asylum because uh, I feel myself very free in UK and I really love to live here as uh, what I am. In Pakistan, Zane hid that he was transgender. It was only when he came to Scotland this year on a student visa that he began openly living as a man. He's now quit his course, moved to Birmingham and is claiming asylum. I know my family, like they are very religious. So is it persecution that you fear or is it discrimination? I am not fleeing because of persecution. But when I told back to my home about my situations, that I am living openly here and I am very happy here. At that moment, I really, really very badly threatened from them. In West London, Mansur has been waiting for six years for a final decision on his asylum application. In his home country, Bangladesh, being gay is criminalised, but his claim has been repeatedly rejected. My first court judge said that because I'm manufacturing about my sexuality, but I really don't understand how I'm going to be make man manufacturing about my sexuality. Monsoor and Zain are supported by Mazia Shirali, who runs an organisation for LGBT asylum seekers and disputes any suggestion that some pretend to be gay. From the background that I came from, it is not easy for yourself to label yourself what makes, what puts you in trouble. But with the asylum backlog at a record high, some agree with the Home Secretary that distinctions need to be made. We can't tell uh, whether or not these claims being made are legitimate. And we, we can sense from the overall numbers with which we're having to deal that something's gone wrong in the whole system. Just hours before the Home Secretary spoke, the body of a 24-year-old Eritrean woman was found on a beach near Calais. People remain desperate to reach the UK, despite the warnings from politicians about what might happen when they get here. Becky Johnson, Sky News. The president of COP26, Alok Sharma, has announced that he will stand down as an MP at the next election. Mr Sharma didn't give a reason for his decision, but it follows his criticism last week of Rishi Sunak's decision to water down net zero. Well, let's get the latest from our political correspondent, Gurpreet Nawan. Uh, Mr Sharma at the UN General Assembly in New York last week, while Rishi Sunak was not, of course, clearly not happy with the climate policies of his party leader. Yeah, and it comes a week after Rishi Sunak rode back on some of the government's key environmental pledges, a move that alienated some in his party, including Alok Sharma, who was critical of that decision to delay the ban on the sale of new petrol and diesel vehicles and to delay or to dilute plans uh, to phase out gas boilers. Uh, the climate, of course, 
is an issue that is very close to Alok Sharma's heart. He was chair of the COP26 conference in Glasgow a couple of years ago. And of course, it was he, along with the then Transport Secretary Grant Shapps, who announced that decision in the first place to ban the sale of new petrol and diesel vehicles. And Rishi Sunak's latest backtracking on the face of it, at least, appears to have pushed him over the edge. He wrote in a letter to his constituents in Reading West, where he served as an MP since 2010, that the decision to step down had, be, had not been easy for him, but that he would continue to support his Conservative colleagues and champion the causes he cares deeply about, especially climate action. So hinting there in the final line at his motivations towards leaving. But with his party slumping in the polls, he now joins more than 40 Conservative MPs who have announced that they will not be running in the next general election. And that's the most of any ruling party since Labour lost 100 MPs ahead of the 2010 general election. Gerpreet, thank you. Five Bulgarian nationals accused of being part of a Russian spy network have appeared via video link at Westminster Magistrates Court. The three men and two women have been accused of conspiring to collect information intended to be directly or indirectly useful to an enemy from the summer of 2020 until February of this year. Sky's Ashna Hurinag reports. Five people on British soil suspected of spying for Russia. That, the allegation facing a group including Biza Shambazov and Katrin Ivanova pictured here. A network the prosecution told Westminster Magistrates Court that's alleged to have carried out surveillance on people and places targeted by Russia. Allegedly, in order to assist the country to conduct so-called hostile action against specific targets, including potential abductions. Vanya Gabarova all in Rusev, Ivan Stoyanov are accused of being group members too. The court heard that 45-year-old Rusev's home in Great Yarmouth is said to have been the operational hub for their work. But the other defendants lived in suburban properties around London. The Bulgarian nationals had EU settled status and had been living in the UK for a number of years. They appeared here at Westminster Magistrates Court via video link and spoke only to confirm their names and their dates of birth. All five were arrested in February and are alleged to have conspired with Jan Marsalek and unknown others. Mr Marsalek is the former chief of payment tech company Wirecard, which famously soared from start-up to stellar sums and then in 2020 into financial chaos when €2 billion Euros went missing from the company's accounts. Businessman Mr Marsalek is still wanted by Germany on suspicion of fraud offences, his whereabouts are unknown and has not been charged with any offence. The five defendants, meanwhile, have been remanded in custody until the 13th of October, when they'll appear at the Old Bailey. Ashna Harinag, Sky News. Sky News has heard from some police officers who say they would put down their firearms if the officer charged with killing Chris Cabber loses his anonymity. Beck Commissioner Sir Mark Rowley told a London policing board meeting that there are significantly fewer firearms officers on the streets, but the force is still able to provide credible cover. Rachel Venables reports. We can provide credible uh, firearms cover for London. But I must be honest, it's still significantly less than normal. The Commissioner of the Met Police having to explain why there are fewer armed officers available on the streets of London after some refused to carry firearms when a fellow officer was charged with murder. Officers are extremely anxious. and I think it's important to put this in context. A lot of this is driven by families. Many of them are under pressure from their partners, sort of wives, husbands parents, children, who actually are saying, I'm worried about what you might go through based on your job. I'm not sure we're up for this as a family, um, given the severity of it and the longevity that it might go. Yesterday, the Met Police said they no longer needed the army to be on standby as enough officers had returned to armed duty. But now Sky News has heard from more firearms officers who say they may be prepared for the first time to hand in their weapons if the officer charged with killing Chris Cabber loses his anonymity at a hearing next week. One officer told us the anonymity hearing will determine what happens. If he loses his anonymity, then serious questions will be asked. I haven't handed my firearm in yet, but I would if that happens. And there are many others that would do the same. 
Defendants don't normally get anonymity, but judges can grant it in exceptional circumstances. Certain orders in place for, for people like this officer, you know, a counter-terrorism specialist firearms officer, whose daily work involves being covert, you know, he may be involved in all sorts of terrorist operations, you know, to, to, to identify him in the public realm is not just dangerous to, to him, potentially his family and other people, but it also, you know, it, it, gives, it gives the impression that to, to other officers that this, this sort of thing will happen. Meanwhile, there's growing discontent from some people about the Commissioner's calls for greater legal protections for armed officers. There is no trust and faith in the community in places like this. There is no faith, there is no confidence, and it's clear, everybody can see, they do not wish to be held to account, especially by the black community. If the Commissioner wanted to reassure Londoners that things were getting back to normal, it's clear that many armed officers are in fact still deeply unhappy with the threat of further protests looming large. Rachel Venables, Sky News, New Scotland Yard. A court has ruled that Donald Trump committed fraud for years while building up the property empire which helped him on the road to the White House. A civil lawsuit brought by New York's Attorney General found that the former president and his company deceived banks and insurers by massively overvaluing assets and exaggerating his net worth on paper, which was used in making deals and securing financing. The number of people killed in an explosion in Nagorno-Karabakh has risen to 68. The blast happened at a fuel depot near the regional capital, Stepanakert, as people who were trying to flee the disputed region lined up for fuel. More than 28,000 ethnic Armenians have now crossed into Armenia, saying they fear ethnic cleansing after Azerbaijan seized control in a lightling military operation last week. David Williams is suing the production company behind Britain's Got Talent, the ITV show he appeared on as a judge for a decade. The case has been listed as dealing with data protection, although no further details have been given. The future of the UK rail network has made headlines this week with the soaring cost of HS2. But today, social media was abuzz with one particular story of passengers finding out their train had been cancelled while they were on it and apparently before the staff on board. While well, train cancellations on the same line followed, hours of waiting and further hours of travelling for hundreds of passengers, hundreds of miles, some by taxi, into the early hours of the morning. Sky's Inzaman Rashid reports. It was the last place over 200 people wanted to be, and that on a Sunday night. Preston Railway Station kicked off the train and stranded many miles from home. The 440 from London Euston to Edinburgh set off as normal, but what unfolded for passengers like comedian James was far from a joke. And we got an email saying that uh, the train had been cancelled when we were on the train. It was just, here's a cab, get in the cab, They'll take you to Edinburgh. No other trains, no replacement bus services. The contingency plan, dozens of taxi drivers to embark on mammoth journeys. Finished about six o'clock last night, went home, had a bit of rest, and then I got to find out people are still waiting. And I come out and I went all the way to Dundee, which was about 251 miles. Amongst the passengers were 50 school children, 200 miles from home. Fed by a local takeaway and driven up to Scotland via a coach, they returned at 3am. Almost a third of all trains across the country are either delayed or cancelled. And for this particular operator, it's almost 70%. Avanti West Coast told us whilst alternative transport and overnight accommodation was sourced for most of those impacted, we fully understand the frustrations of those customers whose journeys were affected and we are extremely sorry for this. But for Alice and Jack, coming in the other direction from Glasgow, it took 12 hours to get home to their dog buddy. I would have thought that they'd have some sort of plan in place to deal with these situations so vulnerable and elderly passengers and school children weren't left basically stranded. It's not the first time an influx of passengers have disembarked in the town for the same reason. And with a continued struggling rail network, it certainly won't be the last. Inzman Rashid, Sky News, Preston. 
So Ian McKellen is returning to the stage in London to explore a theme familiar to most pet owners, whether being devoted to your dog is easier than holding down a human relationship. The Olivier Award winner co-stars alongside Endeavour star Roger Allen in Frank and Percy. Her arts and entertainment correspondent Katie Spencer went to the West End to meet them. He's been an arch-villain in X-Men. You shall not pass! A wise wizard in Lord of the Rings, but forget about battling the armies of Mordor. Sir Ian McKellen has delivered some killer theatre performances during his career. Ah! Cue the 84-year-old actor returning to the stage, this time alongside Roger Allen. You don't think it's a bit loud? No. In a play called Frank and Percy. When I read it, I just saw it as a comedy, and I didn't really think of it as being a gay play, but I, <laughs> of course it is. Uh, but that doesn't seem to face theatre audiences one little bit. In fact, they, they, they revel in it, don't they? They really do, yes. yes. And, uh, and suggest to me that the world actually has become a slightly better place over the last ten years. And the bedroom, of course. Exploring grief, ageing and desire after middle age, a topic often written off in TV and film. Well, we can't imagine our parents having sex, even though they must have done it at least once. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. But in this case, it's grandparents having sex. And, uh, and you know, people are living longer, and I presume they're having sex longer. And uh, in this case, it's two men. This is the second time the pair have worked together, almost 20 years on from appearing in Panto at the Old Vic. Sir Ian, not a fan of how modern audiences are mollycoddled. Outside theatres now, in the lobbies, including this one, you, the audience is warned. There is a loud noise at one point. There are flashing lights. Uh, there is a uh, reference to smoking. As an actor, I guess, does it kind of spoil an element of surprise sometimes? I, I think guess, it's ludicrous. Yeah. yeah, myself, yes, yeah. absolutely ludicrous. I, I quite like to be surprised by loud noises and uh, outrageous behaviour on stage. While it might seem like an unlikely pairing, playing a couple comes naturally. Oh, yes, that's very dashing. Mm. Well, I haven't heard that word for a long time. Really Katie Spencer, that. Sky News. Well, that was Sky News at 10. Coming up, we'll take a first look at tomorrow's newspapers in the press preview. Tonight, we're joined by the broadcaster and commentator Ali Mirage and The Guardian's Whitehall editor, Rowena Mason. Welcome to both of you. Well, among the stories we will be discussing, this on the front of the Metro, about the Home Secretary's migration speech in Washington today, the headline, Sweller, it is too easy to be a refugee. Plenty more on that and other stories when we come back.
Well, this is Sky News in just a moment. The press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. First, though, a reminder of our top stories this evening. Sky News has is seen inside a hospital in Wales where half the wards have had to be closed because of crumbling concrete. The Home Secretary has questioned international rules on refugees and asylum seekers, saying discrimination is not enough to claim asylum in a speech in Washington today. And the Met Police Commissioner has warned that armed police cover in the capital is significantly reduced from its usual level after some firearms officers handed in their weapons and stepped back from their duties. Well, hello there, you're watching the Press Preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. Time then to see what's making the headlines with The Guardian's Whitehall editor, Rowena Mason, and the broadcaster and commentator, Ali Mirage. Lovely to see both of you. Uh, with us from now until just before midnight, but right now, front pages. Let's start with the Metro. It uh, sums up the Home Secretary's migration speech in Washington with the headline, Suella, it's too easy to be a refugee. The Times picks up on her remarks that immigration is a threat to the West. The mirror sums up her speech in one word, poisonous. The eye reports that private schools are gearing up to fight plans by Labour if it gets into power to end their exemption from charging VAT on their fees. Same story for the Daily Mail, which says that what it calls Labour's class war would begin on day one of taking power. The Guardian says that health experts are calling for a more feminist approach to cancer to eliminate inequality after figures show that 800,000 women worldwide are dying needlessly from the condition every year. The Telegraph leads with a report on the effects of COVID lockdown, which has concluded that the harm that some children suffered was preventable if ministers had thought more at the time about children's rights. The Financial Times hears that the US Federal Trade Commission and 17 state governments are accusing Amazon of effectively creating a monopoly by taking nearly 50% of the proceeds made by its third party sellers. And finally, the Daily Star claims to have saved the world by buying a plot of ground on the moon to keep the US and China apart and prevent them from starting World War III. Well, reminded by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of the papers while you watch us. So let's head to Rowena and Ali. Welcome to both of you. Um, Bravman for a number of newspapers. Day two for some of them, to be fair. Um, Ali, why don't you kick off? What did you make of what she had to say uh, and the critique that many have given the speech? Well, it was a very punchy speech. It was quite a long speech as well, about 4,500 4, words. So it's quite, you know, detailed. It was very interesting because she's obviously clearly... Uh, taking a real, uh, focusing on this whole uh, uh, illegal uh, migration issue, which has been dogging her own uh, uh, her, her own position for so long uh, on this. We have 170,000 backlog that she's dealing with at the moment. And some would argue, actually, that she should be focusing on trying to reduce that backlog rather than taking cheap shots. But she also said very, very clearly that uncontrolled immigration is an existential uh, threat and challenge to the political and cultural institutions of the West. I mean, this is very, very punchy stuff. Now, uh, if she's going to make arguments like that, uh, she needs to back it up. I mean, the reality is we do have an illegal migration problem in this country. I agree with her on that point. But you need to be very, very careful as a Home Secretary with the language that you use. I mean, she's talking about the fact that LGBT people or people who feel that they're being discriminated against, that should not be uh, uh, enough of a threshold to come here and seek asylum. 2%, less than 2% of people are citing that as a reason. So I understand that we need to break the, um, the people smuggling gangs uh, uh, business model. I get that. I support her on that. But I think some of this language is incendiary. And if she wants to talk about multiculturalism, and I have some issues with multiculturalism as well, but it needs to be handled and explained very clearly what she means. Otherwise, this is incendiary. Well, what she's talking about is in 1951, it meant persecution. Now it means discrimination, and that's not on. And if you include discrimination, effectively, quoting Nick Timothy and uh, a colleague, 780 million people worldwide would fall under the UN Convention, which would be an existential threat to Western society. And the nation state, which she says is so important as binding, um, you know, our society and our rules. So, you know, is she right about that? This idea that discrimination is morphed into discrimination when it really means a threat to life? Do you think that is happening? 
I think what she's talking about it being a threat to Western civilization. I mean, that's very, very many steps into the future that it, it, nobody could possibly say that that's happening now. Um, and it, it's dangerous, her critics say, to be uh, trying to draw this distinction between persecution and discrimination. There are lots of people all over the world, LGBT uh, people, uh, women who are suffering really severe worries about uh, discrimination and, and horrible practices. In Afghanistan, for example. In Afghanistan, for example. In Afghanistan, I mean, for the, example. Yes. Safe route, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, one of the problems with the argument that she's putting forward that we shouldn't be taking anybody from, from France because that they're not a refugee because they are in a, what she'd call a safe third country. I mean, that, that's completely nonsensical when we don't have safe routes for people who are yeah, suffering the, persecution. The point she's saying there, though, is France. that when you leave a, a war a war zone, for example, when you migrate from that to a safe country, you are an asylum seeker. Beyond that, you're, you're shopping around. Well, I, I, I agree with her on that. I think she's got a valid point on that. And the thing that, Rowena, people never, ever are honest about when they talk about this is, what is there going to be a cap on refugees coming to this country? I mean, even the Labour Party, last time I heard Stephen Killing, even he was being open about the possibility of Labour come in, of there being a cap, because you have to cap the numbers. So if we want to talk about safe and legal routes, but I you get can't that. Cap the numbers if you can't control them, and they can't control. Well, you them. you at least should, in principle. The, the argument people give Anna is that the reason why people are coming across in boats and paying unscrupulous people smugglers fifteen grand a pop to put their lives at risk in the channel is because there are no safe and legal routes. My argument is, if you want safe and legal routes, have them, but they have to be then be capped. Yeah. What she what she wants to do though is sort of ripping up this decades-old convention, um, potentially withdraw from the from the ECHR as well, the European Convention on Human Rights. I mean. That is not something that Rishi Sunak and his government have said that they would want to do. I mean, they've said that they'd keep options on the table if they can't implement their Rwanda policy, but they have not gone that far. It's a very, very extreme. So is she being a loose position. cannon? I mean, is this a leadership pitch? Yes. I mean, it is a Looks very like thin, it. it's a very thinly veiled leadership pitch. I think we can all agree on that, really. And you know, it's come in the week before Conservative Party conference. It's not clear quite how sanctioned this is as an intervention. It certainly goes further than the government. Well, it's taken HS2 off the front pages. Has done. <laughs> Um, indeed so. And, in fact, I heard there was debate about whether to release the speech embargoed till 10.30 last night and the decision was to release it. wonder why. Anyway, but there we are. There's the, uh, the Guardian, the UN rebuking Braverman over human rights claims. Great long statement from them. Um, they said the Refugee Convention is the cornerstone of the international refugee protection regime and remains a life-saving instrument that ensures millions of people fleeing conflict and persecution each year can access safety and protection across borders. Talks about the numbers, 780 million. They say actually there's 35 million refugees worldwide, 70% remaining in countries neighbouring their own, yeah. like, for example, uh, Ethiopia for Sudan, Jordan, Turkey, and then specifically on the UK in this great long statement, an appropriate response to the increase in arrivals and to the UK's current asylum backlog would include strengthening and expediting decision-making procedures. So why don't we expedite decision-making procedures? I mean, she's she's just she's talking about um, she's talking about sort of ripping up the whole system when there are potentially ways that the small boats problem could be addressed much closer to home. What Labour's talking about is trying to do more deals with France to stop this happening in, in the first place, having a closer relationship with the EU to try and stop the problem at source, um, and. Uh, the other thing that the opposition parties are pointing out is that the, the current system is, is, is in chaos because of Conservative inaction on the backlog of processing mm. asylum applications. So, you know, there are so many things that could be done before we get to this point of kind of making great big international statements about ripping up the whole system well, that governs yeah. the world. Well, I think Starmer, look, Starmer's trying to be pragmatic by going and uh, trying to say to Macron, look, we're out of the Dublin Convention because we left the EU, let's uh, form another deal. The reality is I don't think that's going to really move the dial. I do think that they should be processing the backlog faster. But the problem here is the productivity is really low. They're processing about one application a week. Some of these people but, but are, are really... But are they held up in appeals? That's my... That's well, there my are appeals, but also you've got very inexperienced staff and they're quite difficult to recruit people to actually process this. And the numbers are... They are huge numbers coming across. And the other thing where I do have some sympathy with Braverman and the government is that some people are abusing the asylum system to come here. There were 12,000 Albanians last year who were economic migrants. They were not asylum seekers. There are many genuine asylum seekers, but they weren't them. And that actually abuses the whole system 
for other genuine people who are fleeing persecution. The Mirror has picked up on this as well. I'm just going to read out the uh, head of Amnesty International's response. The Refugee Convention is a cornerstone of the international legal system. We need to call out this assault on the convention for what it is, a display of cynicism and xenophobia. My point is, is this an election winner? Do people want to see the end of the boat crossings and other forms of migration? Well, I think Suella Bradman probably does really genuinely believe this is her you know she's l long been a hardliner on immigration i don't think anyone can doubt that um but i i think part of her calculation is not necessarily even whether this is an election winner for her and her party is what happens after the election it's what happens if the conservatives lose the election and rishi sunak steps down this is a very strong pitch well she's middle the ranking right of her party well... and it's I imagine it will be very popular with uh, well, conservative look, members. I don't think Rowena's wrong. I think she's middle ranking <laughs> in the con home in the con home table, the league table of uh, ministers, and and Kemi's out way out in front at the moment. So they're all positioning and jockeying um, ahead of what is going to look, look uh, increasingly look like a defeat for the Tories next time. I had a sudden flash that Liz Truss could stand again. Anyway, never know. <laughs> No, no, no. Anyway, um, so talking about election, uh, let's go to the Daily Mail and indeed the I, which ran this last night. It's about whether or not you um, add VAT to private school fees. Um, clearly a divisive issue. The Daily Mail saying uh, it's a class war, Ali. It is a class war, and it's an utter disgrace, quite frankly. There are lots of people up and down this country that can ill afford to send their kids to private schools, including my sister, who sends four of her kids there, works day and night to do it. I also went to a private school. Uh, my parents also worked very, very hard to do that too. The reality is that there are some private schools that this will not affect at all because they're going to be the preserve of increasingly richer and richer people. You also often see... Often from that, abroad. To often be, from yeah. abroad. But this will actually squeeze hard-working people who actually feel that the provision, the state school provision in their areas is woefully inadequate. So I think this is the politics of envy. And I also think that the, the Labour Party has to come clean about the fact that 20% of parents who are sending their kids to independent schools at the moment say they will have to pull them out if this VAT uh, exemption um, gets uh, slashed. Uh, that is going to that is going to uh, come in, and they're going to have to spend another hundred to three hundred million on kids who are going to go back into the state sector. Well, and what's going to happen, Anna? Mm -hmm. What's going to happen? People are going to move to to houses. You're going to have an increase in house prices with parents who can afford to buy expensive houses close to the best schools. Well, That's you, what's going to happen. You know that happens already, don't you, anyway? Of course but it does. Estimated £1.7 billion a year could be raised, so your £300 million extra cost may be still you get a profit out of it. The I says the head teacher of Starmer's old school urges him to, to reconsider the plan. Now, why is this popular amongst Labour voters? And the presumption that suggestion was it was a million parents, I think, might be affected by this, that those people would not vote Labour. I, I think that Labour will not be too worried about these headlines, about a sort of backlash from private at schools because they think it is popular and they will just be happy that this policy is being talked about. Um, it's one of the few sort of di real dividing line policies between the Tories and, and Labour. Um, they think that people, that people like it. Most people don't send their children to private schools and that, as you say, the people who do send their children to private schools are more likely, not all of them, but more likely to, to, uh, to vote for the Tories. Mm. Uh, yes, 93%, isn't it? Is it 7% go to... 6 or 7% go to private schools? Um, water companies, uh, let's take a look at the metro, shall we? Uh, water companies have been ordered to give back £114 million to customers after failing to meet key targets, here's the list, to reduce pollution, leaks and supply interruptions. To be fair, the weather's a bit... Uh... Interesting at times, isn't it? Well, as someone who's had their basement flooded with uh, sewage um, uh, in London, I mean, I, I know a little bit too much about this uh, issue, more than I would like to know, and I've actually been dealing with my insurance company that's finally signed off, which is great, so I should be getting that repaired, but a great, uh, a great uh, personal hardship, quite frankly. Uh, this, is not, this is not a great advertisement. We do need to upgrade our Victorian infrastructure. We need to ultimately spend more money on that, and that means the bill payer is going to have to pay. Someone has to pay. Off what the regulator is actually saying, that you've got to give back this £140 million uh, pounds to your um, customers because your, leak, uh, your leaks have been so bad, your record on uh, sewage has been so poor. So obviously water companies need to deal with that, but fundamentally someone's going to have to pay and it's going to be the bill payers ultimately. That's what's going to happen. And fundamentally they need more water storage so we don't put sewage into the sea and that probably will be an election issue, will we now? I mean, it really will be. It's something that gets the voters going so much. This persistent, um, flagrant abuse of the rules by some of the water companies um, releasing sewage into a 
Britain's waterways. And to be honest, 140 million doesn't seem like enough to stop them doing it. You know, this, this has been going on for so long, it's not stopping. The penalties just seem to be a, a slap on the wrist compared with... Yeah. But They're but getting fines on top, I suppose. But we've got Victorian there, so. infrastructure, that's the point, particularly in large cities like London. This is why, for example, the Thames Tideway Tunnel that's been built under the Thames is going to actually have a material effect, because when you have heavy rainfall like we've been having in the last few days, a lot of this becomes raw sewage going into the... And you have to be, you know, brave to go and swim in that, uh, you know, in the Thames, quite frankly. But that's what happens. So we have to upgrade the fundamental infrastructure, which is very hard and expensive to do. Yep. Thought you were going to talk about railways there for a bit. <laughs> We've done that this week. Uh, anyway, lots more still to come, including could a so-called feminist approach to cancer care save lives? Back with that and more in just a moment. I mean, this is uh, one of the rare occasions we've brought back samples from the solar system to study. We've got moon rocks, we've got samples of uh, the wind from the sun, other samples from asteroids we've got, but this is a particularly large sample from a very important type of asteroid, which will tell us something about the origin of the solar system. And also, should we ever need to deflect an asteroid that's threatening us, it'll tell us something about the structure of the asteroid so so they have to make sure that they're kept pristine you don't want to have any uh, any earth particles you know disrupting contamination, this yeah. contaminating that that sample so they've moved it now to a special um, laboratory curation place in um, Johnson Space Center they'll be very very carefully taking away the layers from the spacecraft and we're hoping within about 10 days they'll actually open the capsule which has got the sample inside it belongs to the United States oh. it's their mission it landed on their territory. So although they will um, store three quarters of it for future reference, because in the future we'll have better techniques to analyze it, and it's a limited resource, um, they will only analyze a fraction of it and they will give it to scientists. The th good thing about this science is that any scientist anywhere in the world, if they come up with a good idea to analyze it, they will get a piece of this asteroid. It's like a time capsule for the, the solar system. Like it's come from very early on when, when planets were forming, but it, it gives us, um, it will give us a, a view into what things were happening then, and hopefully it will give us some idea of how the solar system formed and also potentially what, what were the elements um, that caused the origins of life on this planet if they came to Earth from, from similar asteroids. Well, they were actually going to do a, a a special maneuver that would have allowed them to measure exactly what the weight of the sample was but when they sort of went down and scooped up you say rather more than they expected they actually had a bit of an issue with closing the capsule properly and they started losing little bits of it so they they didn't perform that maneuver and rather just concentrated on Closing sealing the, the capsule <laughs> yeah. and bringing as much of it as they could back down to earth so that's why we, we think it's 250 grams that's from some you know very smart maths and or, you know orbital mechanics that they they've sort of hoped that but until they they get it out and actually weigh it we're not 100 percent sure
Well, welcome back. You are watching The Press Preview. With me once again, Ali Mirage and Rowena Mason. So let's go to The Guardian, shall we? And uh, the story that a feminist approach to cancer could save 800,000 women's lives a year. So what is the principle behind it? Is that testing's not done on women and that uh, symptom, um, symptoms are not assessed as if it was for a woman? That's right. There's this um, huge study that's been done, the largest report of its kind, looking at women and cancer in 185 countries. And... Um, they found really unequal results for women and that cancers weren't being picked up in the same way. Um, I think that there was a particular focus on women's cancers like breast cancer and cervical cancer, despite lung and colorectal cancer being huge killers among women as well. So it's, it's about symptoms not being recognised, about um, treatments being tailored more towards men and that 800,000 women potentially worldwide have died needlessly as a result. I mean, a lot of the difficulty, uh, I understand, is that testing can't so easily be done on women because they might be pregnant and you don't know what a, a baby could suffer effectively or endure. So that has, you know, led to potentially things like heart disease, heart attacks, the symptoms being listed as if they were for a male. Well, indeed, look, I think a lot of the, uh, the, the system historically has been built around men, and I think that's part of the problem here. So if, if this report is indeed showing this, and also this is only one element of it, because I've spoken to a lot of women from ethnic minorities about the same type of topic, and they feel, for example, uh, black women uh, in some cases feel that uh, their pain relief that they're given in childbirth is a lot less than their white counterparts because of perceptions amongst doctors and nurses. Now, that that, that, that is also, there is evidence to cite that too. So I think there are various issues to be looked at here. Clearly, this is a very serious report. It needs to be addressed properly. And if there is an over-focus uh, on certain cancers to the expense of others, just because they're deemed female cancers, that's a problem. I mean, we need to be looking at cancer in the round, all cancers, to make sure that they're picked up early and dealt with accordingly. Mm. Uh, the size of uh, tech companies, if that's how you describe Amazon, um, under the spotlight in the Financial Times, which effectively said it's a monopoly, therefore it can overcharge third-party sellers. It's very interesting. US, US regulators always seem to be quite a bit more punchy than, uh, than our own. And this is the US Federal Trade Commission and 17 American states suing Amazon, alleging that it's overcharging customers and um i guess the question is would a similar thing happen over here would 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 our would our regulators would our government be willing to take on amazon in in quite the same way um i mean some labor has said that it'll look at the, the taxation around online giants but you know this sort of competition uh investigation into big online giants is, is not really as big a thing in the uk mm. There has been a little bit of work around the CMA signing off certain things. I think it was uh, another big deal that was being done uh, a little while ago where they did actually flex their muscles and the European regulators are a lot more amenable to it. Now, on this particular one, Rowena is right here. This is the FTC flexing its muscles, particularly the chair of the Federal Trade Commission, Lena Kahn, who is a, a well-known sceptic of Amazon. She's not a bit, basically a fan. In 2017, she wrote an, ac an academic paper saying that it should be broken up. And so Amazon is retorting, saying, well, actually, you should recuse yourself from anything to do with the governance of us at all because you're a, you're a, you've got a dog in the fight, basically. But the, the figures are utterly extraordinary. One, um, they accuse the 1.3 trillion e-commerce giant of boosting fees to sellers on its marketplace so that it extracts almost $1 in every $2 they make. I mean, that... You know, that's a big profit margin. Well, I mean, it's, it's huge. It's acting like a quasi-monopoly now, and that is where regulators have to step in to try and see what they can do to protect consumers. Yeah. Um, Daily Star, 78 quid. Um, they bought a bit of the moon in that to act as a buffer, they say, between China and the US, because that is the future of mining, apparently. <laughs> I mean, it seems rather cheap, doesn't it, for, yeah. for a patch of land on the, on the moon? <laughs> I'm not really sure how much use it would be, though, so maybe, it, maybe, it's, maybe it's expensive, maybe it's, maybe it's totally worthless. Well, we're all going to be believing in interplanetary living, according to Elon Musk, right? So this is a... <laughs> it seems quite a sensible uh, approach. I mean, in, in the week when uh, NASA brought back that asteroid to Earth, I think all things space are on top of the agenda. But the reality is we are facing geopolitical tensions out there. Yeah. So if you want to go to another planet for safety, it probably is quite a sensible pro approach. Ali, Rowena, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. See you in the 11 right now. We've got Storm Magnus to talk about. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. 
So tomorrow, Storm Agnes does move in. Strong winds, heavy rain bringing the risk of disruption. Most places will have a fine start to the day, but southwest Ireland will be wet and windy. Any mist and fog patches across central, southern and eastern England will soon lift. Rest of Ireland, Northern Ireland, some western fringes of Britain will see rain then moving in through the morning. Expect some heavy downpours, localised flooding possible. Elsewhere, mainly dry northern Scotland, southeast England holding onto some sunshine. Elsewhere, very blustery. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways.